And uh, looking at last year's exam, I think, okay, a lot of this stuff that I normally do is now wrong. Like this is not a closed book exam. And in fact, you might as well use your calculator uh, because, uh, uh, because why not? Um, I won't ask you your name, net ID, or signature, so there'll be no bonuses like this. Uh, you can use all the blue books you want at home. You won't copy any of this. Uh, statements do not need to be justified. Uh, uh, this is still true. Coins and dice are fair. Let me see if I can do this correctly. Coins and dice are fair, and random choices are equiprobable, unless stated otherwise. And on the other hand, this is probably not true. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the question point should be worth, but, uh, but for instance, like uh, a tricky calculation, I think, should be worth more than a, than a simple true-false. So, so we'll have to do some, some figuring about that. Um, the next question is, uh, what do we do about, about, um, uh, proctoring? And, uh, you may request the help of a proctor. Uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, the problem is I'm not sure how, how, you know, uh, we were thinking we might uh, have four separate um, WebEx rooms, and we ask you to join a specific room for the exam, and uh, uh, and then I think you can ask questions privately by by typing into chat. Um, I will say I think I'd like to limit things to two questions each, just because uh, uh, you know just because, but, but it's confusing because what will happen in Sakai is that um, uh, the questions will come at you in a random way and the, your answer choices on multiple choice will be randomized and, and in, in different various many versions. Um, uh, so, so it's not clear how 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 the questioning would work. It makes me think, oh, maybe we shouldn't even have any questions. Uh, so if we want to discuss this on Piazza, we can. Okay, so this was a question last year. Uh, the current is Gaussian. The uh, average value is zero. The standard deviation is four. And you are asked to find the average power. So, so the average power is e of y, it's e of 10i squared, that's equal to 10 e of i squared. And, um, and then the, there's something here that, that isn't obvious, right, which is that um, if you remember um, the variance of i, is equal to sigma i squared. It's equal to e of i squared uh, minus the expected value of i squared. And um, so in this problem, the expected value of i is zero from here. And so in fact, e of i squared is just the variance. And so, e of i squared is sigma squared, which is 16. And the expected power is 10 times 16 is 160. All right. Don't hear anybody complain. x1 and x2 uncorrelated. Um, is the same thing as saying the covariance of x1, x2 is equal to zero. And then the variance of x1 plus x2 
is equal to the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2 plus 2 times the covariance of x1 and x2, but that's 0. Right, so, so, so that's the first step to solving this problem. And, and then the second step is, um, is knowing how to, what these two variances are. So the variance of x1, and uh, for you could go and try to derive it, but, uh, but that would be a mistake. It's kind of a, a pain in the butt using, using integration by parts in sort of complicated ways. But in fact, it's equal to, for an exponential, it's 1 over lambda 1 squared. So it's 1 over 1 fifth squared. And uh, that's equal to 25. And uh, uh, x2 is continuous uniform AB with uh, a equals 0 and b equals 12. And so you should remember this, right? That the, the variance is b minus a squared over 12. And that's equal to uh, 144 over 12. So it's equal to 12. And so the variance of t is equal to the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2 is equal to 25 plus 12, 37. So in this case, if a PDF of u, and it's constant from minus b to b, so so we know because it's symmetric that e of u is zero, right? And um, that tells us that the second moment is equal to the variance. And then we use the same b minus a squared over 12 formula, but it's b minus minus b squared over 12. So that's 2b, so that's 4b squared over 12. And uh, we're told that's equal to, to 36. Let's see if I did that right. Uh, I guess I did. So, so b squared is equal to 3 times 36. And that implies b is equal to 6 times the square root of 3. And now we're interested in what is the probability uh, u is less than 1. So you mark 1 here. And you have to sort of integrate the PDF over this region. So probably u is less than 1 is the integral from minus b to 1 of the PDF du. And, uh, and then you have to remember that, oh, over this region, the value of this height is 1 over 2b. So this is the, uh, the integral minus b to 1. 1 over 2b du. So this is equal to uh, u 2b minus b 1, 1 minus minus b over 2b. So it's equal to 1 over 2b minus a half. So this seems like I, I think I'm I feel like I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> uh, I, do, 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 do. Okay, let me so 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 I'm feeling like there's something wrong here. I have to think about 
Ah, this is plus a half. That's why. So, so um, the problem here was that I was looking at um, this quantity and seeing my answer was going to be negative. And of course, uh, this is a probability and it can't be negative. And so I have to realize that this is minus minus, it's plus a half. So, so the answer is uh, one over two times six square root of three plus a half. Uh, so the answer is one over 12 root three plus a half. Um, uh, that was a, if I did that right, that was a pretty badly designed problem because the answers did not turn out to be at all nice. So let's define W as X plus Y, right? And um, when X and Y are bivariate Gaussian, we know that W is Gaussian, right? Uh, ah, so this is really a bad problem because in fact, uh, you need to know what is the, what does mu x and mu y, what do they equal? So, uh, uh, because the problem doesn't say, it just says that they're unit variance. Okay, so I think it, it must have meant for it to be, to be zero. So we know that sigma x equals sigma y equals one. And so now e of w is equal to e of x plus y. And uh, and so so this is uh, equal to e x plus e y, and those equal zero. And then variance of w is equal to variance of x plus variance of y plus two times the covariance of x and y. And uh, here you kind of have to remember what the definition of rho is. So, so rho is equal to the covariance of x and y divided by uh, the square roots, the square root of the variances, right? But in this case, um, the variance is equal one, right? So, uh, so in fact, rho is also is also the covariance, which is equal to a quarter. And so now you get this variance of w is one plus one plus uh, two over four. And so you get uh, a variance of 2.5. And um, And then the, the probability x plus y is greater than one is the probability w is greater than one. And, and now we're ready to calculate that because uh, we know that w is Gaussian. We know that the expected value is zero and we know the variance is two and a half. So, uh, uh, so the rest of our calculation is that um, this is equal to the probability w minus its mean over sigma w is greater than one minus zero over sigma w doing uh, the transformation I always do. And this is equal to uh, q of one over sigma w and uh, so this is equal to Q of one over the square root of five halves. And so that's Q of the square root of two fifths. So pretty much always uh, your answer to one of these problems will be a phi or a Q of a square root of something. And, and the square root comes out of uh, uh, taking a square root of the variance. Okay, so let's, x is exponential, uh, lambda is 0.2, and what do we know? 
So we know that x is PDF lambda e to the minus lambda x, x greater than 0, 0 otherwise. And um, uh, and so probability x is greater than 10 is the integral from 10 to infinity of the PDF. And this is one, it's kind of borderline. Probably many of you know the answer, but if, you know, it's one where you might just do a little calculus to 10 to infinity because you like to. So this is minus e to the minus lambda x, 10 to infinity. And so uh, this ends up being 0 minus minus e to the minus lambda times 10. And so it's e to the minus uh, 2, right? Because lambda is 0.2, and 0.2 times 10 is 2. And, and frankly, uh, uh, my suggestion is, oh, thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian's the only one who has a charming logo. Uh, uh, Brian is a, um, I don't know if you guys noticed, kind of a mean looking, kind of a growling bear. The, uh, so, um, so uh, the fact is probably you should always just remember for the exponential PDF that this is e to the minus lambda x for all x greater than or equal to zero. Right. Uh, that's kind of a fact worth knowing. This problem uh, about White Castle um, was the thing I discussed in, in lecture. I was asked to sort of tell the story of, um, of the... Uh, of, well, where does the exponential PDF come from? And I had a story that related it to Poisson. And, you know, I, I guess um, I don't have that many stories because I used this story on last year's exam. So, uh, so let's, this problem is pretty, this first step is pretty simple. Uh, no hamburger sold in tau equals, whoa, I'm not sure what happened there. Somehow, uh, my drawing program is got ideas of its own. I'm going to scribble that out. So we're asked here, what is the probability n tau is equal to 0 with tau equal to 3? So this is the probability n3 of 0. So it's uh, 5 times the tau is 3 to the power of 0 e to the minus 5 times 3 for 0 factorial. The answer is e to the minus 15. Uh, it's really small. Uh, since you guys are here, I can just tell you that, oh, I'm, I'm using this problem in, in, in uh, uh, next week's midterm. But uh, it's totally different because uh, White Castle is now Wawa. And hamburgers are now just generic sandwiches. Like Wawa's menu is too big to to really focus on a particular sandwich. So so we had to kind of kind of make it more general. So this is where uh, this problem is connected with this story I told last class. And and so so the thing is, if you imagine you have a time axis, right? You start it time zero, and uh, you say, um, uh, what is the probability w is greater than 3? So you wait at least three minutes until a hamburger is sold. And that means it's the probability that uh, zero burgers are sold in 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 the interval zero to three right so if in fact it's exactly the same probability we had before it's the probability that n3 was equal to zero 
and this is equal to uh, uh, I have to remember. So I think it was five tau. Okay, so this is equal to uh, uh, three times five to the zero e to the minus uh, uh, five times three over zero factorial. The answer is e to the minus fifteen. And um, it's exactly the same answer as we had before. The probability you uh, wait at least three minutes until a hamburger is sold is exactly uh, the same as the probability that you see zero hamburgers sold in the first three minutes. So, so the probability you see that the time until the first hamburger sold is greater than W is the probability that uh, zero, zero burgers are sold in, in the time interval zero to W, right? So um, this is the probability that the number of burgers in a time window of size W is equal to zero. And so this is equal to uh, five W to the zero e to the minus five W over zero factorial. It's e to the minus five W. And so here's what we know. The probability W is greater than W is equal to e to the minus five W for all w greater than zero. And uh, if you think about it, it's equal to one for w less than zero. And maybe your next step is to say, well, that tells me that the CDF is the probability w is less than or equal to w, one minus the probability w is greater than w. And so this is equal to zero for w less than zero, and one minus e to the minus five w for w greater than zero. And then I find the PDF by taking a derivative. And, uh, I get zero W less than zero, and I get a uh, five E to the minus five W for W greater than zero. And, uh, and I'll, so in this problem, uh, W hat is equal to 60 plus W, right? And, uh, and it asks you, what is the PDF of W hat? Um, that's kind of a, uh, um, it's interesting that I asked that. I would have thought maybe uh, we weren't ready for that. Um, if you kind of go from first principles, uh, one way you could do this is to say you would find these kinds of problems are actually uh, our, our next week's problems. It's derived random variables and they're, they're PDFs. But, uh, but I guess, you know, if I want to solve this from first principles, like I would be, let me erase this. I would find the CDF FW hat of W, probability W hat is less than or equal to W, and that's the probability 60 plus W, the random variable, is less than or equal to little w. So it's the probability that W is less than or equal to little w minus 60 
So it's the CDF of W at W minus 60. And um, I had the CDF on the previous slide, but in this recording software, it's kind of difficult to go backwards. But I will just write this down. Uh, this CDF is zero for W minus 60 less than zero. And it's equal to, uh, I got some garbage on my screen here. And it's equal to uh, one minus E to the minus five W minus 60 for W minus 60 greater than or equal to zero. And so, so this is equal to zero for W less than 60 and one minus E to the minus five W minus 60 for W greater than 60. And like what we see here is that, oh, the CDF of W hat is just the CDF of W uh, shifted over to start at 60, right? Then uh, because everything is 60 minutes delayed. But uh, now that I have this, the PDF of W is just the derivative Right, and uh, so this is zero for W less than 60. And this is uh, five E to the minus five W minus 60 for W greater than 60. So now that I've kind of tortured you with this problem, I should say that, uh, you know, I'm not gonna ask this on the midterm because uh, it's really a better problem for the final exam. So, so this is a, uh, a pair of random variables, but it's discrete. And it has this, um, this mystery constant floating around, uh, the mystery constant C, right? And um, the, the first thing you need to check here is that, uh, that somehow, uh, all of the terms of the joint PMF, right? This, they all have to be, uh, I'm using the wrong marker. Uh, they all have to be greater than or equal to zero. And of course, uh, if you sum over all X and Y, P of X, Y, um, that has to equal one, right? So if you do this sum, uh, you see that the first row sums to 0 0.4 because there's a C and a minus C that cancel out. And the second row sums to 0 0.2. And the third row sums to 0 0.4. Uh, so this condition is true for all C. And so you're really just left with checking that, uh, that this other condition of non-negativity is also true. And so you see that um, uh, C has to be greater than or equal to zero because for instance, uh, uh, this value of the PMF is just exactly C. And you also have to have that uh, 0 0.3 minus C is greater than or equal to zero, right? Which says that C has to be less than or equal to 0 0.3. And as long as that's true, uh, that C is between zero and 0 0.3, then you have a valid, a valid PMF. So now we need to find the covariance. So the covariance of x, y is equal to e of x, y minus mu x times mu y, right? And um, uh, if you remember our PMF, uh, our marginal PMF was 
0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. And so mu x is equal to minus 1 times 0 0.4 plus 0 times 0 0.2 plus 1 times 0 0.4. So mu x was 0. And so we know that this term is 0. And, and now kind of the simplest thing to do is to just simply label each entry in the table um, with, e, with the x, y value associated with that pair. So for instance, uh, um, for instance here, this is uh, x times y, which is minus 1 times minus 1, uh, which is equal to 1. And here, x times y is 0. Here, it's equal to uh, minus 1. Uh, this row, x times y is equal to 0 because, uh, because x is 0. And on the, the final row, here, x times y is minus 1, 0, and 1. Right, so we get e of x, y is equal to, uh, uh, so, so we look at all the, you know, the, the expression was this, sum over x, sum over y, joint p of f. But um, in fact, we just need to find the non-zero entries in there, right? And it's this one and this one, and this one, and that one. So it's equal to c times 1 plus 0 0.3 minus c times minus 1 plus c times minus 1 plus 0 0.3 minus c times, uh, times 1. And then you see magically this is all constructed so that the uh, this is zero, and so we get that the covariance in this case is zero. Okay, so we solve this problem. So so what this problem is testing is is. Uh, uh, do you know that zero covariance does not imply independence? So, so, um, so we know that x and y independent implies covariance x, y equals zero. And we observed in the previous thing that covariance x, y equals 0. And, and that's supposed to make you think, oh, well, maybe they're independent, right? But, uh, but of course, you know, I'm, I'm designing the test. So, so my goal is to trick you. Uh, so instead, what you have to do is you have to write down what the marginals are. So here is p, x of x, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. 0 0.4. And then maybe here, we'll use the, the black ink. I'll write p y of y. So this is uh, 0 0.1 plus 2c. And this is 0 0.2. And this is 0 0.6 minus 2c. Right? And uh, and then for x and y independent, you have to check, does the joint PMF, does it factor into the product of the marginals? So, so the general rule you want to, to um, uh, all you need to do is identify one x, y pair where this isn't true. And so for instance, um, we see from the table, right, that uh, the joint PMF at zero, zero, 
is equal to zero. But uh, Px of zero is equal to 0 0.2. And Py of zero is 0 0.2. And, and so the answer to this question is no. So in fact, x and y are dependent. So the, the point of this problem was that uh, just because random variables have zero covariance doesn't mean that they're independent. Uh, x goes from minus 2 to 2. y goes from minus 1 to 1. So inside of this box, we have the CDF is constant. And so uh, that value of the constant times the area of the box, which is equal to 4 times 2, has to equal 1. So C is 1 eighth. For the marginal PDF of x, we have the same box. This is, uh, here is x, here is y. Marginal PDF of x is the integral minus infinity to infinity, joint PDF of x and y integrated over all y. And, and the thing is, like, um, this value of y, right, it matters. So, so for instance, um, this integral equals 0 for... Um, uh, for y less than minus 1. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, my brain is actually, um, I'm going too fast and my brain is getting stupid. So I have to erase things here. Wait a minute. Before I, I have to find the right thing that is actually an eraser. I don't know why my eraser doesn't work. I'm going to. Oh man, I was doing so good and they totally screwed this up. Okay, so so y is the, the variable we're integrating over and um, uh, the value of this integral, just reverse everything I said, it depends on this value of x. So for instance, if I choose an x, right, like over here, like minus three, then um, we're integrating uh, along a line of y's that's over here, and that, that doesn't intersect where the joint PDF is non-zero. So in fact, uh, this integral will be zero uh, for x less than minus two. It'll be zero for x greater than two, right? And now for, for x's between minus two and two, what this integral is, is it's uh, uh, the constant C, which is one eighth times dy. And the integral goes from minus one to one because uh, this lower limit is minus one and this upper limit, limit is plus one. And so I get one quarter. Right, so I get one fourth for minus two less than to x less than or equal to two. Right, and this is our answer. Um, so I'm sorry about not turning on my recording for those of you who are listening to this confusing, jumbled up uh, thing sometime in the future. But we'll solve this problem. So. Right, this is minus 2, 2, minus 1, 1. And we're asked, what is the probability that the max of x and y is less than minus 0 0.3? And because we used 
we knew that they're independent. We know that, well, okay, so we know this is always true. So probably x is less than minus 0 0.3. And the probably y is less than minus 0 0.3, right? And, um, and now we have kind of two ways to solve this problem. Uh, one way is you can just make a mark here at this corner point. So this corner point is uh, minus 0 0.3 minus minus 0 0.3 minus 0 0.3. And you ask, well, what is the probability or like in that this condition is true? And is it's it's the probability we're in that box, right? So so the simplest way to do the calculation is say is it's the it's the joint density one eighth times the uh, the area of of this little box that I drew, right? And that's equal to uh, uh, one eighth, and uh, the width of the box is minus 0 0.3 minus minus 2 and the height of the box is minus 0 0.3 minus minus 1 right and so this is equal to 1 8 times 1.7 times uh, 0 0.7 whatever that number is uh, uh, you could have done it the other way. You could have done this as you, by using independence, it's the probability x is less than or equal to uh, minus 0 0.3 times the probability y is less than or equal to minus 0 0.3. And um, um, in fact, you get exactly the same thing, and it really wouldn't have been any simpler. And and the third way you could have done this is you could just set up the, the double integral. Like this would have been minus 2 to 0 0.3 in the x coordinate to minus 0 0.3, minus 1 to minus 0 0.3, 1 eighth uh, dy dx. And uh, once again, you would have gotten the same thing. OK. Is 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 not completely unstraightforward. Like uh, you want to measure x, but you observe y, which is x plus a noise, and it has this fancy word intermittent that we will define shortly. Uh, but still, we know that e of w is zero. Standard deviation is 0.1. Uh, so so the first part of this problem is pretty easy. So e of y is equal to e of x plus e of w. And e of x is 2. We're told that up at the top of the problem statement, plus 0. So the answer is 2. I guess I forgot to start my recording. So variance of y is variance of x plus variance of w because they're independent. and. Uh, uh, the variance of x is, and I don't remember. Okay, so now I'll restart my recording. And on the previous slide, it said the variance of w is 3. And it said that sigma x is 0 0.1, which says that the variance of x is 0 0.1 squared, which is 0 0.01. And so the variance of y is 3.01, which is a, an answer that you're like, hmm, this should be wrong. But in fact, it's correct. The noise is intermittent because um, uh, w is a product of a and c, where a is Bernoulli, 0, 1. So when it's 0, the noise is 0. And, uh, but when it's 1, the noise is Gaussian, right? So, so we're asked to find sigma w. 
So, so let's start by finding e of w. e of w is equal to e of a times e of c, right? And the thing you have to remember here is that uh, this is equal to e of a times e of c because a and c are independent. Uh, I don't know if it says that anywhere. It should have said that. I wonder if I announced that in class. Okay. Uh, if you don't have this fact, um, uh, yeah, you're kind of in deep trouble with this problem. It's kind of unsolvable, I think. Okay, so, so this is equal to... Um, uh, e of a, so e of a is equal to p, but e of z is zero, so this is zero. And so, so now we can find e of w squared. e of w squared is e of a squared times z squared. And this is, again, by independence, equal to e of a squared times e of b squared, and uh, uh, and so e of a squared, right, is um, hmm. So 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 I'm I'm pausing because I'm like, oh, how many steps should I have done here? I guess I could have written out that a is Bernoulli. Right, and so this is one minus p at a equals zero, p at a equals uh, one, zero otherwise, and so e of a squared is equal to zero squared times one minus p plus one squared times p. It's still equal to p, and on the other hand, uh, e of z squared is just equal to sigma z squared because the expected value of z is zero. And now um, putting these things together, right, I get e of w squared is equal to p times sigma z squared. And so, uh, and, and in fact, this equals the variance of w because uh, e of w we found was equal to zero. And uh, so sigma w is equal to uh, square root p, square root sigma z squared. It's equal to sigma z times the square root of p. And uh, and I see now at the top of the page that uh, p was given to us as one ninth, so so in fact this is sigma z over three. So we start off with the definition of covariance. I just started my recording, and uh, and we have to remember that w is a z, where a and z are independent. And so covariance of W and Z is equal to E of A times Z times C. Right, and so this is E of A times E of Z squared. Right, and E of A is equal to P. And E of Z squared is the variance of Z because Z has zero mean. And, and so this is uh, p times uh, sigma z squared. And um, uh, so now we're ready to find rho of w and z. It's equal to the covariance of w and z over the square root of the variance of w times the variance of z. And um, uh, so this is another one of those moments where I kind of have to cheat for a second and go back and look at what 
what the variance of W was. And so now I recall that the variance of W is P times sigma Z squared. And so I put all these pieces together and I get this is equal to P times sigma Z squared from, from here all over the square root of p times sigma z squared times sigma z squared and all of the sigma z's cancel and my answer is square root of p and this is kind of a beautiful answer because um uh if p equals zero uh then uh w and z are uncorrelated because uh, w is always zero, no matter what c is. And on the other hand, if p equals one, then rho equals one, and uh, it corresponds exactly to, um, uh, if p equals one, then in fact, w is equal to z, because the intermittent noise, w, is now always the, the on, it's always on, and, and W then is exactly equal to C.